Good morning. It's nice to have you joining us today, and we hope that in this service today that you will be blessed, that you would hear God's voice, and that you would be able to worship with us in whatever form and style you wish. So sit back, enjoy, as we hear God's word and we sing his praises. Join me in singing, surely goodness and mercy. <clears throat> some people, and I get really disturbed by some of the conspiracy theories I read. I've seen some posts who like the American public to sheep, those of us who agree with and, and try to follow the guidelines are compared to sheep, sheep being led down the path to some terrible and horrific end. 
Now, do not get me wrong and don't get the wrong impression here. I'm not saying that the things I've read and seen are false, but I'm not saying either that they are true. I have no opinion upon those things I read. I don't always agree, but I know not whether they're false or true. But what I am saying here this morning is that sheep are getting, or I should say sheep are being given a bad reputation. <laughs> I'll be honest, I never had a lot of respect for sheep as an animal. They're not usually aggressive. They're not handsome by any measure. And if what I have read in the past is correct, they're not the most intelligent of animals either. I've always been drawn to large, more powerful and smarter, intelligent animals. And I think most of the general population thinks much the same way. They see sheep as being weak, dumb, and generally only good for the wool that they produce. But wait, do people even wear wool garments any longer? I don't know. Needless to say, we do not have the same respect for sheep as we do for, let's say, a lion, a large Belgian horse, a grizzly bear, or even your favorite dog or cat. But as I look at our passages for this Sunday, I believe that we are underestimating sheep. So let's take a look at our, our scripture found in Psalms 23. If you want, you can turn with me there in your Bibles as I finish talking here. But let us try to get a better perspective on the sheep and see if we really are like sheep and better define who is leading who, who is leading us. And where are we being led to? Our scripture is written, it's a psalm of David, which means that David wrote this, and this is what he writes. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in right paths for his name's sake. And even though I walk through the darkest valleys, through the valleys of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord my whole life long. You know, I read this week that there are some places in Scripture that are so powerful, so deep, that to recite them is to actually experience them. The Psalms, or the 23rd Psalm, is one of those passages the 23rd Psalm is a very personal passage, so much so that it moves people's, people to tears at times when they hear it. I, I read one scholar who stated that the Psalm itself is a green pasture. The Psalm itself is a still water. The Psalm itself self restores my soul. Is it any wonder that songs are written about it, like the one we sang this morning? Is it a surprise that people use it as the message when we mourn the passing of loved ones. This passage is David's testimony, his personal experience with God. Pastors like myself come to this passage in a time of mourning so that, that we may help those in need of comfort, encouragement, and hope. It is, it is precious to us. It is a healing balm for our broken hearts, an inspiration for our souls. Many cherish this passage as a constant friend that supports us in all of life. It possesses a simple beauty. It speaks of green pastures and still waters. Who doesn't like to sit on the green grass next to a stream as it slowly flows down the stream? But it also talk, takes us through dark valleys, past our enemies and our adversities. But what comforts and helps us is the confidence we find in this psalm. 
David really believes all that he writes about God. We appreciate that what David is writing is not poetic exaggeration or theoretical theology. He has experienced God in each of these ways. He's heard God's voice. He's followed the Lord's direction. He's known God's care. Otherwise, David wouldn't be there to write this passage. And we find beneath the beauty of these words, very, very solid convictions formed in the experience of conflict and trials. The conflicts and trials that David experienced in his life. And I only know these things about a man who lived a thousand years before Jesus because he's left us clues right here in this psalm. Notice that in the first three verses, David refers to God in the third person. The Lord is my shepherd. He makes me lie down. He leads me. He restores my soul. But then in verse 4, David shifts gears, so to speak, referring to the Lord in the second person. I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me. You anoint my head with oil. And then, in the verse 6, he returns to the third person as he closes out this psalm. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord my whole life long. So why do you think David switches in these verses from one vernacular to another, from one person to another? Why do you think David does this switch from talking about God with he to talking about God with you? And why does it happen in verse 4? Why didn't he just go on to say, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for he is with me. His rod and his staff, they will comfort me. Perhaps we find David becoming more intimate with the Lord in these, in these verses as he talks. David begins by talking about God, just like I talk about God at times. And then he transitions in his passage, in this psalm, from talking about God to talking to God. In verse 4, he describes a valley in which he has walked. He's felt the darkness of life and the shadows of death. David is talking about the crises in his life, the crises of pain, the crises of hope, the crises of faith that he's experienced. And in those times, something very deep happens between David and God. It's in times like these that something deep happens between us and God as well, don't you think? You've noticed it too, haven't you? We're more likely to talk about God when we are in the green pastures. Did you see what God did? Did you see what He did? Did you hear what, what so-and-so experienced? But we're more likely to talk to God when we're in danger, when we're in toil, when we're in despair, and, and in any situation that would bring us there. In the light, we are susceptible to wander off pursuing greener grass, but in the dark, we cling to his knee as tight as we can. David changes from comments about God to communion with God, because during these times in the valley, he has stayed as close as possible to the good shepherd. He's never taking his eyes off of him when there's danger around. He experienced God in a way that ushered him to intimacy with the Good Shepherd. And, and might I add here my own observation from Easter morning sunrise service, we cannot focus on the sun when we're focusing on ourselves. We find ourselves these past few weeks in new territory. We find ourselves in a place of confusion, worry, Concern for our own well-being and uncertainty of the days to come. Questions arise. Questions like, will we catch this virus if we go out in public? There's a possibility. Something we should really be worried about. Are we going to be able to get the groceries we need to survive? Are these rumors of, of, of conspiracies 
Are they true? Are our rights being stripped away from us as they tell us that we must stay home? Is this all just a ploy to fix the next presidential election? I've heard them all. We've heard, heard these questions. But deep down in, the question comes, are you worried? Does these, do these issues worry you? For some of us, no. But for some of us, they are very real dangers. They are very real toils that we must endure. But take heart. I'm not so worried. I am worried. I, I, I'll not lie to you in all my life and all the things that I've worried about in the past. The events of the past few weeks have me a little more worried than I've ever been. Unsure about tomorrow, more unsure about tomorrow than I've ever felt. But take heart, I'm not so worried, so afraid that I'm paralyzed like a sheep cornered by a ferocious predator. I'm not that scared. I stated a few weeks ago that I do not know the answers to the questions this country is asking. I don't know what to tell you to make you feel safe. But I know the one who does. I know the one who, who is there for you when things are difficult, if we would only rely on Him. And that's who I rely on. So allow me to invite you to a safe place where we can see that in this time of crisis, God is closer than you think. My prayer is that God will imprint His truth in your heart, that you will find confidence in Him. Confidence to rise above the storm clouds in your life, even as David did. Look closely and see David's confidence in times of crises. First, I want you to see that God allows us times in the valley. There are times when God allows us to go into the valley. In the first four verses of Psalms 23, David takes the general picture of a shepherd with his sheep to describe the relationship God has with us and we can have with Him. Lying in green pastures. Walking beside still waters. Everything makes sense. In our understanding of a shepherd leading his flock. In those situations. The green grass and calm waters. But in verse 4 things change and everything doesn't fit. The valley of the shadow of death invokes images of dangerous situations, peril, where a sheep's life is in jeopardy. Unless the sheep shepherd, unless the shepherd is alert and attentive. But why would a sheep be going through such a place? Not because he's straight off in sin, that's not the point here. Because the shepherd is pictured as going with the sheep, not snatching him back to the pasture he left behind. The reason the sheep is going through the valley is because the shepherd is leading him there. Not to say that the shepherd brings us into trouble, but he leads us through trouble. The connection between verse 3 and verse 4 confirmed this. The path through the valley is also one of the paths of righteousness in which God leads his sheep. He guides me in paths of righteousness, the passage says, for His name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Now I'm sure you may ask, why would a good shepherd, one who would lay down his life for his sheep, lead a lamb into a valley filled with danger and potential death? Why would a good shepherd take his flock to a place where, where they could be slaughtered? Why would he lead them to a place where the bad guys could take them, where animals could attack them? Well, there's only one possible answer I can think of. The reason a shepherd would lead his flock through a dangerous valley is to get to some place better, to get to some better place. Philip Keller, an Australian shepherd who wrote a book called A Shepherd's Look at Psalms 23. In it, he writes, The shepherd knows from past experience that predators take cover in these broken cliffs and, and they prey on his flock. 
The shepherd knows the hazards that lie within the valley. But he also knows that the valley leads to something of great value. He also knows that the, the value of what lies on the other side of that valley. When you're walking through some unfamiliar valley and the shadows linger, when you have cancer and have to decide whether it be chemotherapy or some other treatment or no treatment at all. When you, you're trying to decide as a matter of godly stewardship whether to take your money out of the market or let it ride. When your finances are tight and you're taking on another job to make ends meet. Remember that the shepherd knows the peril that lies before you, but has not brought you here that you may perish. He didn't bring you here that you would, you would die. He didn't bring you here that you, would, that you would fall away or that you would fail. He brought you here so that you might think, you might receive the treasure of great value on the other side. Every valley is a pathway to something better. As Psalms 84.11 says, No good does the Lord withhold from those who walk uprightly. Or as Paul put it in Romans 8.28, We know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to His purpose. The valley isn't good. It isn't. The valley's not good. But the shepherd is, and he knows the way. Next, you need to see that no matter what difficulty you face, the shepherd has you covered. He's there for you, and he's there to protect you. David tells us how to be fearless in adversity. Even in the valley of the shadow of death, he didn't dread the distress he would face or cringe in the face of crises. How do you fight fear when you don't know what's going to happen next? What do you do? Where do you turn? How do you fight fear when your imagination is working overtime, working continuously, and what it's telling you is not any good? How did David do it? Well, David tells us his confidence came from three sources. We find them here. David stayed in God's presence, and we must too. We must stay in God's presence. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for you are with me. He speaks of God's nearness and presence. When you step into your valley and it's so dark that, that you can't see the path ahead, the possibility that there are predators and enemies waiting for you, your shepherd wants you to hear these words, I will be with you. I am all you need to get through this valley. All you need is the shepherd. Jesus wants you to know all you need is Him. Hebrews 13, 5 and 6 says it like this. It's very simple. And it's Jesus saying, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? Or, in other words, something that I've said many times over the past few years, what can anybody take away from me that the Lord has not given me and that the Lord can return to me if it is taken? Next, David saw God's power. And we must be focused on what the Lord is doing so that we too may see His power. How many times have I said, how have you been fed? Where have you seen the, the hand of God at work? We have to be looking to see where God's working so that we can see His power. As a shepherd's rod was a two-foot club made of oak. It had a rounded head that was whittled from the knot of a tree at the end. And then there were sharp bits of metal pounded into it. This club was used to defend the flock against attacks. It symbolizes the power of the shepherd wielded against overpowering enemies. David said he had no fear in adversity because of the comfort of God's power, protecting him from that which would ruin him. And you need not fear either. Greater is he that is in... Let me do this again. Greater is he that is in you 
than he who is in the world. John, 1 John 4, 4. Greater is he that is in you than he who is in the world. David experienced God's leading, and you can experience God's leading as well. Your staff comforts me, he said. He's referring to the shepherd's crook with the big hook on the one end. We, we see these things in Christmas plays a lot. A good shepherd would use it to guide the sheep, lest they stray away. As they're walking down the path, he would just give them a tap on the side and they would get back onto the path. If they would fall over a ledge, he would use the hook to, to grab a hold of them and pull them back up to safety. We, we see the picture of, of Jesus reaching down and getting the one lost sheep. You know, he's there for us. Just a gentle tap of the staff on the lamp's side would move them back into the fold. And the crook would gather up sheep from a place where it might have fallen. David felt comforted that his sheep, that his shepherd, was guarding his steps, making sure that he makes it through the darkness to safety. David was supremely confident Confident in God's grace that would see him all the way home in the future. He believed that, that valley times were appointed for his own good. A time for him to work on his faith and his trust in God. He learned things about God that, that were learned no other way than the deep ravines of life. He stayed close, trusted in God's protection and guidance all the way. All because... He could say, the Lord is my shepherd. But today in closing, I want to point out one more thing that's found in, in, in John 10, verses 1 through 10. If you take a couple seconds to turn there. Jesus says, very truly I tell you, anyone who does not enter the sheepfold by the gate, but climbs in by another way is a thief and a bandit. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him and the sheep hear his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all of his own, he goes ahead of them and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. They will not follow a stranger, but they will run from him because they do not know the voice of strangers. Jesus used this figure of speech with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So again, Jesus said to them, very truly I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who come before me, all who came before me are thieves and bandits, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters by, my, by me will be saved and will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I said earlier that sheep were given a bad reputation for being unintelligent. And, and here's why. Take note to what Jesus is saying about sheep. The sheep know the shepherd's voice and follow him and only him because they know him. Sheep do not follow a stranger's voice. They run away because they do not know him. So the question from, for, from me to you today is this, and it's very simple. Is the Lord your shepherd today? Do you know His voice and are you listening? Are you following Him as He speaks His words of love over you? Where is He leading you right now? The green pastures beside still waters? Or are you traveling through the valley in the shadow of death? No, if you're traveling a difficult path in these days, that the Lord is with you. He will not leave you. If you will just follow Him. If you hear nothing else today, hear this. Jesus wants to be your shepherd. And He wants you to be His sheep. But it requires you to trust in Him and to rely on Him and look to Him when you need direction and help. There's only one way that this can be done. By learning the sound of His voice. You learn the sound of His voice by talking with Him. Telling Him that your heart's desire. Listening to His words of love and life. Listening to His words of instruction. Listening to His words of correction. Listening until His words become your words. 
His way of thinking becomes your way of thinking. So the question remains, are we sheep? I mean, after all, that's what I titled this sermon. Are we sheep? Are you sheep? Well, I'm going to tell you, if the Lord is our shepherd, then we must be sheep. His sheep. Stay in God's presence. We can walk without fear knowing that He walks by our side, guiding and protecting us, showing us the way, comforting us and encouraging us. See God's power leading us through difficult times and places like we are traveling through in these days of pandemic and days of COVID-19 and, and social distancing. Experience God's leading, leading us to a better place where we will find green pastures to lie down in and still waters to walk be beside and listen to. Leading to a better place, a place that He is preparing for His sheep where He will anoint our heads with oil and our cups will overflow. And we will be able to dwell with Him there forever and ever and ever. Amen. When you find yourself weak, when you find yourself in the dark, and when you find yourself in uncertain times of the future, when all the color is drained out of life, and your soul is downcast, look up. Fix your eyes on Jesus, your good shepherd. Stick close to Him. Cling to His knee. Trust that He knows the way through the valley and He will see you safely through. Believe that He has good reasons to, for taking this route, even though it is hard and unfamiliar. And hold on to the truth that there is something better waiting ahead on the other side of this valley. Join me in closing. As we sing the song, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. Jesus.
receive great rewards as we follow you through to the other side. Give us, Father, your blessing. Be with us as we move throughout our week to come. Help us to encourage others. Help us to trust in you and help us to be the people you have called us to be. Help us to be your church. We ask these things, Father, in your precious name. Amen. Well, I'm glad you were able to join us for this time today, and, and I hope that you're able to join us again next week as we come together in this way. I know it's difficult, and I know it's trying, but trust me when I say, the Lord has great blessings ahead for His church and for you. Have a good week. I'd like to uh, sing the song, I Know Who Holds Tomorrow. Join me in singing if you know the words. <laughs>
spare no tears.